There was an orphanage in the ghetto run by a man called Henrik Goldsmith, better known to the world as Janusz Korczak. He was born in 1878 in Warsaw, then part of the Russian Empire. An incredibly bright man, he earned money as a tutor and then studied medicine at Warsaw University. He was always torn between a literary and a medical career. Not only did he study medicine, but wrote for several Polish newspapers. In his spare time, he taught children in the poor districts he had moved into. His first book, Street Children, gave a realistic description of life in the slums of Warsaw. He believed passionately in social justice, and after qualifying in paediatrics, he worked in the Warsaw Children's Hospital. He gained much recognition for his work, Child of the Drawing Room, and said, if you want to reform the world, you have to reform education. He travelled widely to study further child development and took a position as supervisor and educator of children's camps. Before the First World War, he directed an orphanage for Jewish children in Warsaw. His methods were revolutionary. He founded a children's republic with its own parliament and newspaper. He gradually reduced his medical duties but kept a few rich patients to facilitate his work. His fees for the rich were huge, for the poor nothing. His orphanage became the most advanced in Europe, and he developed a worldwide reputation. He said, education must triumph over medicine for me. A spoon of castor oil is no cure for poverty and sickness. After World War I, Poland became independent from the Tsarist Empire, and he went back to running his orphanage. During the horror of that war, he had written his most important book, how to Love a Child. In 1922, he established an orphanage for Catholic children. And in 1923, he published another book, King Matt I. The little prince inherits a utopian kingdom and he battles all the injustices of the world. During the 1930s, he had his own radio program. Each year, he visited Palestine and the Gibbutzin. This caused anti-Semitism in the right-wing Polish press, which led to his estrangement from the non-Jewish orphanage. Every week he would testify in the Warsaw Juvenile Courts. He would testify defending destitute and abandoned children of the streets who were often given long sentences. When the ghetto was established, Korczak would not abandon the orphan children and moved in with them, although he was offered the opportunity of escape. His assistant left Palestine to come back to be with him. In the ghetto, he became a beggar for the most helpless. Daily, he visited the Judenrat, seeking food and medicine for the children. He took over the Children's Refuge, a temporary hospital for sick and dying children. It was the first hospice of its kind. He tried to maintain dignity and normality in hell. When his followers tried to persuade him to leave, he said, you wouldn't abandon your own child in sickness, misfortune or danger, would you? How can I leave 200 children now? His growing despair made him anxious to leave a final testament. The last words were, I am angry with nobody. I do not wish anyone evil. I am unable to do so. I do not know how one can do it. On August the 6th, 1942, in the huge deportations, the German soldiers came to collect the children, 192 of them and a dozen members of staff, to transport them to Treblinka. An eyewitness recounted the death march of Korzak and his children. They marched with their heads held high, carrying the orphanage flag that Korjak had designed, green with white blossoms on one side and the blue star of David on the other. As one eyewitness told, I will never forget that sight to the end of my life. It was a silent but organized protest against the murderers, a march like which no human eye has ever seen before. It was an unbearably hot day. The children went four by four. Korjak went first with his head held high, leading a child with each hand. They went to their death with a look full of contempt for their assassins. When the ghetto policemen saw Korjak, they snapped to attention and saluted. Who is that man? asked the German soldiers. I hid the floods of tears, though weakened by fatigue. Korjak walked with a firm step leading his children in calm, orderly ranks through the hushed streets of Warsaw to the train station. 
Without a backward glance, he and the other teachers helped the neatly dressed children, each carrying a favourite toy or book, up onto the ramps of the waiting trucks, whose final destination would be the gas chambers of Treblinka. Mordechai Anielowicz was a left-wing Zionist, a brilliant organiser, and his dream was to settle in Palestine. After the invasion, he and other senior members of his movement fled to eastern Poland. He managed to reach the Romanian border to establish an escape route for young Jews to reach Palestine. He decided to return to occupied Warsaw, but en route, he stopped in many towns and villages, organizing communities. He and his lover, Mira Fucha, set up new youth groups, cultural activities, and helped establish a newspaper. He set up seminars and arranged meetings. He also studied Hebrew and read history, sociology, and economics. In October 1940, the Nazis established the Warsaw Ghetto, and it was in June 1941, after the invasion of Russia, that the Nazis began the mass killings of Jews. Anielewicz began to concentrate on creating self-defense organizations in the ghetto. He tried to establish contacts with the Polish underground. In the summer of 1942, the mass deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto began. At that period, Anielewicz was in southern Poland, transforming Jewish youth groups into armed resistance movements. When he finally returned to the Warsaw Ghetto, only 60,000 Jews remained. Over 300,000 had been deported to their deaths, and the head of the Judenrat had committed suicide. Anielewicz strove to reorganize and reinvigorate the underground. In November 1942, he became the commander and established contacts with the Polish underground. And on January the 18th, 1943, the Germans launched the second mass deportation from the ghetto. It was at this stage that the fighters joined the column of deportees and attacked the German escort. Many fighters died, but four days later, the Germans halted the deportations because of Jewish resistance. Over the next three months, they consolidated. The final deportation of Warsaw's remaining Jews was launched on April the 19th, 1943, the first night of Passover. This was the signal for the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. They held out against the German army for four weeks. The Germans suffered huge losses. When they were finally overwhelmed, Mordechai and Mira retreated to the bunker Mila 18. Poison gas was used and the bunker fell on May the 8th, 1943. Anielewicz and most of his comrades were murdered. He left a final letter, which was sent to a colleague on assignment on the Polish side. I cannot describe to you the conditions in which the Jews are living. Only a few will hold out, the rest will die sooner or later. Our fate is sealed. In all the bunkers where our comrades hide, you cannot light a candle for lack of air. I don't know what else to write to you. I suppose that your questions are many, but this time, please be satisfied. Peace to you, my friend. Maybe we will meet again. The main thing is, my life's dream has come to be. I had the privilege of seeing the Jewish defense of the ghetto in all its greatness and glory. One of the responses to the Warsaw Ghetto was the suicide of Shmuel Ziegelboim. He was one of the two Jewish members of the Polish government in exile in London, and he wrote this letter and addressed it to the political leaders of the Allies. I cannot be silent. I cannot live whilst the remnants of the Jewish population of Poland, of which I am a representative, are perishing. My friends in the Warsaw Ghetto died with weapons in their hands in the last heroic battle. It was not my destiny to die together with them, but I belong to them in their mass graves. By my death, I wish to make my final protest against the passivity with which the world is looking on and permitting the extermination of the Jewish people. I know how little human life is worth today, but I was unable to do anything during my life. Perhaps by my death, I shall contribute to breaking down the indifference to those who may now, at the last moment, rescue a few Polish Jews still alive. I bid farewell to everybody and to everything that was dear to me and that I have loved.
To stay up to date with JTV content, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and hit the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. If you enjoy watching JTV content and want to help us continue to grow, please consider making a donation to us by clicking here.